Today at the National Press Club, four crossbench MPs will outline their policies and detail how they may work with the next federal government if re-elected on May 21. Zali Stegall, Adam Bant, Rex Patrick and Craig Kelly with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra for today's Westpac Address. I'm the club's president, Laura Tingle. There has been a lot of commentary during the election campaign about the possibility that the result after Saturday will be a parliament in which the crossbench holds a balance of power and with it the power to determine which major party forms government. That's because of the rise of a large field of independent candidates who are given a very good chance of winning seats in the cities and in the bush. We have asked members of the House of Representatives and Senate crossbenchers from the last parliament to join us today to reflect on the role of the crossbench and on what they would bargain about if the election result gives them that opportunity on Saturday. <coughs> the structure of our discussion, given the need to give time to all four of our panellists to answer our questions, is that I will put a series of questions to the panel who will each get 90 seconds to answer. We will then move to questions from the working media, depending on time. Each member of the panel will be given two minutes to give finishing statements. Could you please join me in welcoming Zali Stegall. Green <laughs> Greens leader Adam Bant. <laughs> UAP's Craig Kelly. <laughs> and Senator Rex Patrick. Well, thanks all for joining us today. Uh, as I said, it's been a subject of considerable discussion. If I could first ask you uh, to each reflect on the work that you've done in the parliament just finished on the crossbench, could you tell us what your voting record is with the government and what you think your most important contribution was to the parliament? Uh, we might just go across this way for the first question. Craig Kelly. Sure. Um, I only became a member of the crossbench at the Labor uh, 12 months ago. Uh, in that time, I've had a much greater appreciation of the strength that they have and the ability that they have to influence policy uh, in this country. At many times, I've negotiated with members of the Labor Party, which is something I would have never have done as a member of the government or the coalition, and which often gave me a greater uh, perspective of the reviews. I've also worked with um, the other uh, crossbenchers on legislation that's been proposed, the establishment of an independent commission against corruption which was something from all edge of the political spectrums on the crossbench that uh, we could get together. Look, I think one of the most important contributions that I've made uh, during the period, that the short brief period I was on the crossbench, was when we looked at the changes that were being made to stapling of superannuation. There's a real concern there that that stapling would have left a lot of young Australians when they went from a very basic uh, workforce from Coles or Woolworths, for example, a retail environment, into a high-risk environment. The decisions that the government were making would have seen stapling not only their superannuation, but their insurance, their life insurance, that may not have been valid with that change. Thank you. Sally Stegall. Thank you. Well, look, a key component as an independent is actually transparency and to ensure that my community feels represented and has a real voice in Canberra. Uh, and that has mean pulling back the curtain when it comes to the processes in Parliament, which many people don't realise the extent to which they could, in fact, participate. Uh, my voting record is transparent. It's on my website, as is my process of considering legislation, because I think it's really important if we address the challenges that we face in this next decade is actually that we look at pr providing good legislation that is built on its merits. So my voting record, about 80% of legislation passes on, on the voices, which means both sides of parliament agree to it, um, and about 20% is contested in divisions. Of that contested vote, about 51% are voted with government, 49 against. But more importantly, which I would say to Australians, is more than one and a half times votes in the parliament have been spent on gagging debate which is breaking down the very purpose for which the chamber is there for, democracy, that we have an exchange of ideas. And government has used its majority to gag debate. I have consistently voted against that because I believe my community wants us to have a sound debate. The crossbench has brought forward integrity, action on climate change, on so many more aspects, and we need to have that transparency. Thank you. Adam Band. 
Thanks, Laura. I think during this parliament we've seen a terrible government in action and I think if you look at uh, my voting record, you find that a lot of the time I'll be voting against the government. They've made the climate crisis worse. They've put up the price of housing. Um, on the, many of the issues that we care about as the Greens, like making sure no one in this country lives in poverty, uh, we've been uh, at odds with the government. The crossbench, I think, has worked really well together to put climate and integrity on the agenda. Um, one of the things that I guess your question about what we're we most um, proud of in terms of achievements, I think we've uh, managed to get the question of coal and gas on the agenda. The, everyone in Parliament at the moment is saying that they're for climate action, but the government is uh, wanting to open up more coal and gas. Coal and gas are the leading causes of the climate crisis. And one of the things we found on voting records is, is that it's often the Greens and some others on the crossbench sitting on one side, but Liberal and Labor sitting together on the other to fund opening up of new coal and gas mines, to oppose lifting income support above the poverty line, to give tax cuts to Clive Palmer and the wealthy instead of making sure that everyone else is looked after. What you often find is that it is the crossbench giving voice to what I think the majority of people in this country would agree with, while Liberal and Labor are over there sadly voting together. Senator Patrick, obviously uh, the crossbench in the Senate has a slightly different role from the one in the House, but um, what have you been up to? Oh, look, uh, I have voted with the government uh, about 50% of the time. Uh, we in the Senate, uh, as a part of regular business, are involved in the review of legislation, all types of legislation. Uh, I've moved successfully amendments, disallowances. Uh, I've uh, had a private members mill get through the Senate. Dealing with uh, big issues, bringing some of the issues uh, across from people like Zali uh, on, on uh, climate change uh, back into the Senate, putting pressure on the government, putting pressure on the government in relation to uh, an ICAC, very important for Australians. The other role, of course, that the Senate performs that doesn't happen uh, in the House is, is uh, oversight. Uh, I think I can safely say most people understand me to be a transparency warrior, uh, making sure that the government is doing the right thing, whether that's by way of inquiries uh, or uh, you know, putting pressure on a government through uh, things like uh, freedom of information. Uh, I've obviously had a very successful win in relation to opening up National Cabinet to, to review, uh, trying to suppress some of the secrecy that's taken place with this government. Uh, I think it is one of the most uh, secretive governments we've had, and actually, that uh, you know, when we, uh, if I'm able to return, that's a key issue for me is to transform the way our parliamentary system works because I because I don't think it works as well as it should. Thank you. The major parties aren't great fans of independents and minor parties. Uh, how do you think the growing number of independents has influenced Australian politics? We might start with you, Zali Stick, all this time. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> well, I think this is a problem of the major parties' own making. They have ignored the calls around key issues, around climate policy, energy pol policies, integrity, anti-corruption. For so many years, communities have had enough and they are emerging, realising that their vote is theirs and it can count. And every vote in the House matters, especially when you have tight government or, I would argue, a parliament of balance if neither side has a majority. So communities have decided they don't want their vote in the House of Representatives to be a proxy vote for a major party, for people behind the scenes making decisions without consulting with communities. So of course the major parties do not like this challenge to the status quo. For so long it's been this question of wedge the other side, this focus, rather than looking at long-term policy, things that will make a difference to our children, to our future, to our communities. They are just interested in holding on to power over the next three years or, or keeping the other side out of power. And that is just so uh, just disappointing for so many communities. So what we're seeing, a rise of independent voices around so many communities. It started in Indi. I know Warringah has inspired so many communities and I have people here from Warringah today who are so excited about we can do politics differently. It can be about positive vision. It can be about solutions and it can be about accountability. And that's what independents represent. Adam Bant. I think Zali's right. I think it's, on the whole, it has been great for democracy and it's forced issues onto the agenda that the otherwise wouldn't be there. And one of the things that I've learnt from having been there for um, a while now is that you put ideas on the table, like an independent 
Commission Against Corruption, marriage equality. Um, for a long time, they say, no, 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 that's terrible. And then they turn around at the last minute and pretend it was their idea all along and say, what a wonderful idea. And that's one of the things that we, I think, as crossbenchers do, is put those issues that I think the Australian people want to see debated onto the agenda and we shift the debate, as well as, at times, getting legislation through. I think in this election campaign in particular, that's turned into this contest between a terrible government and a visionless opposition, people are crying out for third voices that will tackle the big issues. Talk about um, housing affordability in a real way that's not just about pushing up prices. Talk about a real plan to get out of coal and gas. Talk about an integrity commission with teeth. And they see it from us and they see it from the crossbench. And I think that's why you're seeing, um, according to some polls, the combined vote for the old parties at record lows, and I expect you'll see that uh, play out on election day as well. Senator Patrick, I'd be interested in your view of how how the independents uh, rise in the uh, in the House has changed things, as well as just re reflecting on on their role in the in the Senate. The government is trying to scare people with uh, th this whole thing about independents holding the balance of power. That's actually operations normal in in the Senate. Uh, we have worked in the Senate. Uh, often uh, legislation is non-controversial. It goes through just with a tick. Uh, sometimes it is Labor that negotiates a position with the government. Uh, when the tricky legislation gets up, it is the crossbench that take that legislation and have it amended uh, generally to make it uh, better legislation. So that's one of the absolute strengths that we have uh, as uh, independents in, in the Senate. Uh, it's something we do all of the time. Sometimes uh, we move disallowances where we've got major parties, uh, both of the major parties, a little bit uh, reticent to uh, take on an issue because there's controversy. Just by an independent stepping up and moving a, a motion or moving a disallowance, it forces a position from the major parties, and that's that's a good thing. Uh, finally, uh, you know, we're able to speak about things that don't conform with party lines. A good example of that was my calling for a cut in fuel excise uh, in mid-February. Uh, we had both uh, the government and the opposition rejecting that, that proposition, but through uh, the pressure of independence, suddenly getting other uh, pe people from other parties coming on board, the government were forced to make a change, and as Adam said, when we finally got to budget night, it, uh, a fuel, uh, cut in fuel excise was actually the government's idea. Yes, it often happens that way. Craig Kelly, you're a late convert to the, case, uh, to the cause of um, being independent, as you said, but um, how do you, ha having made that jump, how do you see the way it's been already transformed politics and how do you think it might yeah. transform it in the future? Laura, what was one of the great concerns to me and the reason why I made the decision to leave the Liberal Party is I felt the Liberal Party had abandoned their traditional values during this period of government. They state on their website, you can still go there, it's still there, that they believe in the inalienable rights and freedoms of all Australians. They say if you, are the, if you believe in freedom and free enterprise, they are the party for you. Unfortunately, during my period, during this last parliament, I found those values they had walked away from. They are values that I believe in my heart and my conscience. And my conscience would not allow me to sit in that parliament and to be quiet and watch those values that I believe in trashed. So I had, feel I had no alternative to go and join and sit on the cross benches. And I believe sitting on the cross benches is the best way that I can stand up for those very fundamental values that I still believe in and advocate for every day and have advoca advocated for every single day of my parliamentary life. The next, que <clears throat> the next question uh, I'd like to ask you all is, um, is about a, the possibility of a hung parliament. There's been a lot of discussion about a hung parliament and what the crossbench might seek to gain from the major parties if they hold the balance of power. If you could list for us, uh, if you could, what your priorities are and what specific commitments you might want, for example, on climate change. Uh, many of you have also, for example, advocated for an increase in the job seeker rate. Would that be part of your negotiations? Would you seek specific commitments about how the parliament is run? Uh, for example, commitments on time to debate private members' bills? Would you extend uh, the, uh, the demands to institutional arrangements like the independence of the Auditor General, changes to the Reserve Bank, or the appointment and role of public servants? Um, we might start with you, Adam Bant, please. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So we've been very clear. Um, if we find ourselves in a balance of power parliament, which 
suggests uh, is it very much on the cards and we're certainly going to be in balance of power in the Senate and potentially the Greens will be in balance of power in our own right. We've made our position very clear. Um, we won't support a return of this current government. It's time for the government to change. But the next government needs to do better. And so we'll push the next government to act on the climate crisis uh, and our position during those uh, negotiations would be stop opening up new coal and gas projects. We can have a debate during the next parliament about what targets we should have and how quickly to get out of coal and gas and support workers along the way, but everyone should be able to agree, don't, you, you don't put out the fire while you're pouring petrol on it. So stop opening up new coal and gas projects, absolutely critical. But we also want to tackle the cost of living crisis. Getting dental and mental health into Medicare will be a priority for us. In the last parliament, we got dental into Medicare for kids. We want to get dental into Medicare now for everyone. Uh, build a million affordable houses over the next 20 years and make childcare free. We want to see justice for First Nations people with progress on truth and treaty as well uh, as voice. And also push to wipe student debt uh, and lift support for people who are doing it tough by lifting income support. So those things would be on the table. And yes, there is a real opportunity in a power sharing parliament to reform parliament and the institutions to make them work better and more transparently. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Uh, all of the things that you've talked about um, occurring in the House already occur in the Senate. We already uh, do all of those things. And uh, again, the wheels haven't fallen off our democracy. In actual fact, our democracy has been strengthened by the ability to you know, call inquiries, to, to look at um, uh, disallowances, to uh, bring on a private members' bills. Uh, th that is just bread and butter for, for the Senate. There is no, should be no fear in uh, what it is that uh, happens with a, with a hung parliament. One of the things that people need to do, however, when they're considering uh, who they vote for is understand that it's a long game. It's not just about the first moments of the parliament when uh, there's a choice about confidence or a choice about supply. You need uh, critical thinkers who uh, can look at legislation, not make instant, instant decisions, uh, run through Senate inquiries, uh, make sure due diligence is done, hear from all sides of uh, the question to make sure that you come up with the best answers, to make sure that you understand what the unintended consequences. Uh, I often see people uh, poking and trying to get a quick answer from, from parliamentarians, but actually in, in most cases uh, it's best done in a slow and methodical manner. And that's what happens in the Senate and it would be good to see some of those changes in the, in the House. Craig Kelly. Three things. Firstly, this global uh, accord that the World Health Organisation is talking about, this global pandemic accord, we will ensure that that doesn't go ahead. We'll expect a commitment from either side of politics <laughs> to make sure that is rejected. We've seen how they do things in China, that lockdown in Shanghai, uh, putting cats and dogs in bags and beating them to death. We cannot surrender the sovereignty of our nation, our medical decisions, to the World Health Organisation. Secondly, we'll ensure that all the mandates end. No one in this country should be forced to ever have to put the risk of losing their job to undergo a medical intervention or injecting any substance in their body. Everyone that is currently mandated out of their work must have their job back. And thirdly, thirdly, we currently have a health crisis in this nation. The Australian Bureau of Statistics data shows that for January 2022, this January, we've got deaths running 22% above the recent historical average. There is a crisis in healthcare in our nation. We've had these government uh, bureaucrats, health ministers, both federal and state, Labor and Liberal, running around saying they are keeping us safe. The data shows we've had 22% increased deaths in January and no one can explain it. Sonny Stegall. Uh, a focus for me will be to bring back integrity and truth to politics. We need to bring back some fact checking to what gets said on Hansard and how the process of parliament works. A very big priority for me as a representative for Rohingya is to bring forward the climate change bill and to legislate net zero by 2050. We must have clear 
and detailed framework around how we are going to address global warming and climate change. We need to embrace the opportunities that come out of the biggest challenge we face, which is that transition to net zero. But to do that, we need fiscal discipline. We need to end the rorts. We have to have a Federal Integrity Commission and anti-corruption with teeth, with powers, to ensure Australians can trust that their taxpayer dollar is being spent to their best benefit. We need to bring back some respect in Australian politics, and that is by looking at the procedural aspects of the chamber and how we work. And that there are so many issues, but at the end of the day, in the circumstances of a pa parliament of balance, which is what I would argue is a minority parliament, we have to look at collaboratively working around the issues. We have to also be real. The current government is a coalition. It is a minority government of the Liberals and the National, but there is a secret deal negotiated after each election to give them that power to form a coalition. I do not believe secret deals are in the best interest of Australians. It is incredibly important that we have transparency and accountability. So whether or not there is a hung parliament or a majority government, what would be the signature policies that you'd like to be pursuing in your time in the, in the parliament, whether it's in the House or in the Senate? Maybe we start with you, Senator Patrick. Yeah, look, I think we need to uh, approach uh, Australia, Australia's future in a different manner. We're seeing a hodgepodge of policies being announced by the, the government and the opposition. We need to have a coherent strategy. We need to focus on things like manufacturing. We need to stop exporting iron ore and export steel. We need to stop exporting lithium and export batteries. We need to stop exporting research and export products. They're the things that drive wealth, they drive jobs, uh, they uh, uh, generate intellectual property, they assist in exports and, and it's that along with things like a fairer tax system, making sure multinationals pay tax and making sure we get proper resourcing or return for our finite resources, uh, uh, our, our LNG for example, there, all of those things will give us the ability to then go and pay for all those things that we need. Uh, that is good education, good uh, health care, good child support and you know, a much needed improvement in, in aged care. So we need a, a coherent plan. We're not getting that from either the government or the opposition. We're just getting absolute negativity uh, in, in relation to uh, you know, what's being uh, announced in this election campaign. No vision. I'd like to see a, a, a plan and I've, I've got things that I think will help Australia move forward. If I could just do as a follow up, um, just maybe 30 seconds or so for a response. Um, you say you want to stop the export of, of, say, coal and lithium and see the manufacture of, uh, of, of batteries here. Are you actually saying we should stop exporting them? I mean, a lot of people talk about bringing manufacturing back on shore, but what would be the mechanism by which you do that? No, I don't say uh, uh, stop. Uh, uh, maybe it's stop just exporting. We've got to do more here in Australia, and, and we can do that if the government actually invests in our manufacturing. Not only does that create all those jobs and wealth, it also helps with that resilience that we found we don't have, uh, and uh, sadly it took a pandemic to show us that, that we don't have that. We've got to change the way we do business. Great, Kelly. Firstly, we will tackle the debt. Mr Albanese and Mr Morrison has not talked about the debt once during this election campaign. It is now a trillion dollars. That is a million, million dollars a debt that we are passing on to our kids. Now, we've set out a bold, bold proposal to deal with this, a 15% export licence fee on iron ore. And that will help what Rex said, to get more manufacturing, more processing in Australia, plus giving us the revenue streams to pay that debt back. Secondly, we'll tackle the housing affordability in this crisis by reinvigorating regional areas of Australia. We have a 20% tax discount for both income tax and personal tax in all regional areas 200 kilometres outside the city. We've got to give young Australians, reinstate the Australian dream of home, home ownership. And we can't do that by crashing prices in the city. We've got to increase the supply in the regional areas where the land cost is cheaper, but you've got to have jobs and industry in those areas first. That's what our plan will do. So if I could follow up with you as well, why only put uh, an export tax on iron ore? Why not put it on coal? Uh, and also your party's promoting 3% uh, housing interest rates. Mm -hmm. To be able to offer 3% housing interest rates, banks have to be able to lock in 3% sure. 
uh, money that they can raise themselves. Can you tell us how they're expected to do that sure. in, in, uh, in basically free world markets? Okay, there's two parts to that question. I'll take uh, both parts separately. First of all, we have a quasi-monopoly position in the export of iron ore, unlike we do with coal or any other commodity. Our only real competitor in iron ore is out of Brazil, who have their production at almost capacity. We're a little bit out of South Africa. The Chinese are desperately trying to get more production running in other parts of Africa. Good luck to them. That will only be in a drop in a bucket. We are look like getting close to exporting a billion tonnes worth of iron ore. It is that unique monopoly, quasi-monopoly position that we have that can enable, enable that to be afforded, which we don't have that uh, quasi-monopoly position in any other commodity like we do in iron ore. There's no alternative. There is no substitute that manufacturers and steelmakers have in Southeast Asia other than Australian iron ore. Now, on the uh, 3% tax, um, firstly, this is for existing home loans only and it's for five years only. The government bond rate currently for five-year government bonds is 2.77%. Now, that is less than 3%. We're not asking the banks to take a loss on this. Yes, they may not be able to enjoy the multi-billion dollar profits that they have made in past years, but this is about saving Australian homes. If there was a bushfire or a cyclone or floods threatening Australian homes, we would act and protect it. We have the same economic storm coming and we've got to protect Australian homes to stop Australians being thrown out on the street. <laughs> Laura, it's very clear for me, we have a very big challenge ahead. The world is on track for over three degrees of warming. And we know from successive IPCC reports that we must transition away from fossil fuels. But with that challenge comes great opportunity. We know there are a lot of jobs, there are a lot of aspects to this. And so for me, a priority is to finally move this government to a position where we actually have a real plan towards net zero. We need to transition our energy. Energy could be 80% renewable by 2030. We need to halve emissions in industry. We need to make sure we finally have a, a framework to enable uh, a transition to electric vehicles. It is incredible that the rest of the world is moving and we are laggards on this front. And this is costing us. It's really important to understand this. Over the last three years, floods and bushfires alone have cost $10.3 billion to the bottom line. And at the last budget, instead of investing in our resilience, only some $210 million was put in the budget towards resilience building. It is leaving our communities unsafe. But overall, arching over this is our Federal Anti-Corruption Commission. Your taxpayer dollar is wasted every time the gov governing body, the, the, the political party in government uses your money to secure its political future. And that has to stop. So we have so many challenges ahead of us. And it is only with merit-based and clever policies that we will actually get there. And I would argue only independents are really bringing that kind of uh, address to these issues. If I could just clarify with you, um, you we, I mean, we want a better, you want a better target um, uh, for uh, uh, carbon emissions reduction. Would you be happy if you got uh, a series of specific commitments to get there, even if one of the major parties, I mean, Labor's saying it won't move on, um, on, on its 2030 target. Would you be happy um, to compromise on just very explicit commitments on policy? Well, I would argue the climate change bill that I've introduced provides a framework to get us there. Let's take the politics out of this and actually trust the science. Let's actually look to how do we fiscally responsibly get there. We know this legislation works. It's been in place for over 10 years in the UK and has brought them to a position of getting to 68% emissions reduction by 2030. The science is incredibly clear of what we need to do. The cost is there. So Labor cannot, with respect, say that it is believing and accepting the science of the transition, but staying outside of the the range that is necessary to do. Ultimately, not many things I agree with Craig on, but one thing I do agree, the market will speak. The free market is speaking. The transition is occurring. It is where the money is. And so the opportunities are there, but the government has the handbrake on and is holding us back. Adam Band. We're going to an election where Liberal and, sadly, Labor's climate targets are based on the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef. Like, that's the level of ambition that they're showing at this election. We need, and this is what we'll push forward during the course of the next parliament, a comprehensive whole of economy plan to power past coal and gas. 
we need a plan to get out of coal in the time that the science requires, but in a way that looks after and supports those workers and communities in those coal areas. Now, I've spent a bit of time this election campaign in the coal and gas areas in Queensland and in New South Wales. And as one coal worker said to me uh, in the Hunter Valley, it's the worst kept secret around here that coal has got to use by date, but politicians keep lying to us about it. Like, and so what happens, and especially every election, is that Liberal, Labor, all the others go in and don the high-vis vest and say, we can keep opening up coal mines and exporting coal out past the 2050s and still meet our climate target. We can't. And if we, ca if we refuse to have a plan to power past coal and gas that looks after those workers and communities, then there's further for them to fall when, for example, as we've seen in New South Wales, a company comes in and says, we're closing the coal-fired power station early. So we've got that plan, creates over 800,000 jobs, it saves the budget money because we stop giving handouts to billionaires um, and instead make them pay their fair share. It's the other thing that we need to tackle is housing affordability, and that starts by stopping this idea that putting more money into the system and driving up prices is going to fix it. Government needs to build affordable homes to give first home buyers a way in. Just one follow-up uh, on, on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and obviously you've got to focus on coal, but what, we've had a lot of spending announcements uh, from both sides of politics about protecting the Great Barrier Reef. A lot of them are about runoff from uh, agriculture and things. What, what is the first thing you would do uh, if you were running the country tomorrow to actually save the Great Barrier Reef? Take action on climate change. Coal and gas are fueling climate change, and climate change is the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef. You can throw all the money at it that you want, but if you keep opening up coal and gas mines, you will cook the reef and cook this country's future. If we want to protect the reef and the 60,000 jobs in Queensland that are dependent on a healthy Great Barrier Reef, we have to get out of coal and gas. And at a minimum, we shouldn't be opening up new coal and gas mines in the way that Liberal and Labor want to do. Thank you. Um, now, my last question, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask this one of uh, you, Senator Patrick, uh, but um, it's, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister himself has become a bit of an issue or has been a bit of an issue during the election campaign. Uh, and Zali Stegall, you've suggested uh, that you'd have trouble dealing with uh, a, a government led by Scott Morrison. I'd just like to ask the three members of the House of Representatives, uh, how important will be personnel in determining your choice if you face uh, a, a balance of power situation? Maybe start with you, Craig Kelly. It shouldn't be about personnel, it should be about policies. I've certainly disagreed with Scott Morrison on many issues. But I'm not going to say uh, what other may said that he should stand down or something if it's a, a hung parliament. It's got to be about what are the policies that are best for this nation. It's who's going to stand up for our national sovereignty at the greatest. As I said earlier, we've got this World Health Organisation pandemic accord. The day that they're debating this, the day after the Australian election. Now, why I want to hear from both Mr Morrison and Mr Albanese that they reject this accord, that they're going to stand up and let Australian doctors make decisions for the Australian public, not be dictated by someone out of Geneva or someone out of Beijing about how we run the next pandemic that comes about. That's what I want to see. Not about whoever sort of whatever personalities or what dress they wear or how they've changed their glasses or their suit. It's policies that have got to count. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, the Australian people will decide because the outcome of the election is the key element, how close either side becomes to forming their own majority in government because we need stability of government. But I do have issues of trust with the Prime Minister. I've observed him over the last three years and I have repeatedly observed him fail to step up to leadership positions, but also to show the adequate res necessary respect for women. I stood out at the March for Justice uh, in March last year when thousands of women around the country were calling for a more respectful environment and he failed in that test. I, st I sat there in Parliament as he talked about uh, protesters not far from here being met with bullets. I saw him absolutely sh horrendously throw Christine Holgate, a professional, a respected, a very high, highly respected uh, executive under the bus in Parliament for political gain. It was entirely inappropriate. 
Like the French president, I have major issues as to the style of leadership that he has allowed to develop in the current coalition. So I will negotiate with both sides and I certainly will address the policy issues Waringa wants me to take forward. But I do have questions of trust and moral compass when it comes to the Prime Minister. If I look at the debate being run out of, with his endorsement out of in Warringah currently, which is essentially a dog whistle putting incredibly vulnerable people in our community to be the fodder of a political debate, completely irrespective of their safety and wellbeing. I do not find that to be the qualities of leadership I, I respect. I want to see this government gone and I wouldn't support a Liberal government led by Scott Morrison or by Peter Dutton. Right? I want to see this government gone. Um, Scott Morrison has certainly failed every integrity test. He has had multiple chances to show that he is worthy of this, this office and he has failed on every single occasion. So we head into this election with, a, um, with no government, re no record at all for them to campaign on. This government, uh, Scott Morrison has chosen to take a group of people uh, that are needing our support and instead try and prosecute some kind of culture war to improve his position in the polls. A Prime Minister that politically punches down is not fit to hold office. But this government has got to go because this government has been the most secretive and least transparent government we've had. They have made the housing crisis worse. They have made the climate crisis worse. They have used public money to open up new gas projects and make the climate crisis worse. So they have to go, but we need a change of government. And in balance of power, we will push the next government to tackle the big issues that they're avoiding during this campaign. But we will see, I think, uh, with Greens in balance of power, action on climate crisis, action on the cost of living crisis. Thank you. Um, Ron Meisen has a question. Thank you, Ron Meisen from the Australian Financial Review. Thank you to the panel for your time. Um, you just mentioned, Mr Bant, one of the things that major parties aren't really talking about this election campaign, um, uh, well, there are big issues. One of those big issues is the sort of the debt and deficit. Mr Kelly, you touched that on, on that as well. You've both put forward, or sorry, you've all put forward um, spending measures, fairly significant spending measures, as well as savings measures to offset those as well. In a hung parliament, um, how will you approach, I guess, fiscal discipline in the sense that if, uh, if you're pushing for a spending measure to be adopted by a major party, will you also seek that that be offset by a revenue, uh, by a, a, a measure to save money? Or will you be happy to let your expenditure go through in order to provide your support? Or would you be looking uh, and, and leaving your, your revenue measures to, to fall by the wayside and therefore adding to the debt and deficit? To all of you. Oh, <laughs> I'm happy to start. Sorry, sorry. I would have liked to see you address those questions and other journalists address those questions to Mr Albanese and Mr Morrison as they've wandered around the country promising 100 million here, 200 million there, 50 million there. The question should be, where is the money coming from? Who's going to pay for this? Are you just going to blow the nation's debt out and pass this burden on to future generations of Australians? That's the question. I, with the greatest respect, I haven't heard the journalists on the campaign trail ask that question. Now, we've put up We've actually put up a bold proposal about getting extra revenue into government. A 15% export licence fee on iron ore. That's what we've proposed. None of the other parties are even talking about this. How they're going to address, increase government revenue to see what we need. Otherwise, all these expenditure promises that we have are meaningless. I want to see that we've got more funds and to ensure that the National Disability Insurance Scheme is fully funded not from borrowings, but going on. I want to see that we've got more money for hospitals, but again, not from borrowings, from actually revenue coming into the government. That's the proposal that we are putting forward, that no one else during this election campaign is doing so. We need to stop the rorts. I mean, the reality is we are spending, well, at, currently we're spending $22,000 per minute on subsidies to fossil fuels. So a transition away from such subsidies will free up a huge amount of revenue, I would argue. The other aspect is we need to actually bring in bang for buck. We have so many programs currently being um, 
where you have government contracts that don't go to proper tender. They are going to uh, mates. We have the Auditor General, our only body, our only cop on the beat at the moment when it comes to our spending. But it has, it does not have the powers to do anything about. It uncovers the misspending, the fact that pu public uh, public funds are not really delivering a benefit. But there's no next power, and that's what the Federal Anti-Corruption Commission will be able to do. It has to act as a deterrence to ensure proper spending. But we need to invest in innovation and research and development. We are falling behind. Our percentage of GDP of investment in innovation and research and development is falling way behind OECD countries. And the only way we are going to continue to be a strong economy in the future is to embrace the new markets, embrace the new opportunities, and make sure we hold them in Australia. We are all, I think, clearly all agree, we need to ensure the Australia, there is more manufacturing and more opportunities here domestically. But again, we have for too long, every time there is invention there is a brain drain from Australia. We simply don't have the policies in place to keep them here. And that is how we will, in fact, ensure we don't leave this trillion dollars worth of debt. We do need to bring back fiscal discipline, though. We cannot keep spending. The amounts of money being promised by the major parties as they travel around the country are obscene. Um, we've put forward measures to pay for our plans. And the basic principle is this. Stop the handouts to coal and gas and make big corporations and billionaires pay their fair share of tax. We have a situation in this country at the moment where one in three big corporations pays no tax at all. Now, when a nurse pays more tax than a multinational, something is seriously wrong. Right? And there's been talk about the fuel excise recently and a temporary cut to that. What people don't know is that Every year when Clive Palmer and his mining corporations go and fill up their trucks, pay diesel, they pay tax, and then at the end of it, everyone in this room, the taxpayers, the public, write him a refund cheque. Now, those kind of subsidies, those fossil fuel subsidies that Zali was talking about, adds up to about $10 billion a year. I'd rather make Clive Palmer pay the same for his diesel that everyone else pays for their petrol and put dental into Medicare. So yes, the Greens will put forward a plan for raising the revenue in a way that does not ask everyday people to pay any more. We'll do it by making the billionaires and big corporations pay their fair share. We'll make Clive Palmer pay more tax so that you can fix your teeth. Uh, one of the things that is missing, uh, again, is vision. Uh, we, we don't have to uh, necessarily cut to, to have advances in other areas. What we've got to do is stop cutting up the economic pie that we have and in, in the manner in which we've done it in the past. We need to grow that pie. We need to make that pie tastier. Uh, I've mentioned that that means we need to manufacture he uh, here. That, uh, that generates wealth and, and provides us with resilience. Uh, we also need to make sure multinationals pay tax. We also need to make sure we get a good return from uh, any of our finite resources that we are uh, in fact exporting. We need to make sure that, that our money is spent wisely. The, the uh, Morrison government has spent $5.5 billion on not getting a submarine. All of those sorts of things uh, uh, need to be uh, uh, sorted out. If, if we, again, if we have a plan that looks at all of that, then we don't have to worry about cuts. We can actually spend the right amount of money on uh, aged care, spend the right amount of money on uh, healthcare and education. And we can do uh, all of this in a, in a manner that uh, takes the opportunity of, of heading towards renewables with the right system engineering to make sure that, uh, that, that we've got uh, a, a solid and affordable electricity uh, supply or energy supply. All of this is possible, but you need to have a plan, and that's what's missing from both of the major parties. If I could just ask a follow-up uh, on that, which basically I'm hoping you to say yes or no, um, but certainly limit it to 15 seconds. Um, we've got massive tax cuts for higher income earners coming up in the so-called uh, stage three tax cuts in a couple of years worth billions of dollars. Uh, would that be a, something that you'd negotiate uh, or support? Do you, do you support the stage three tax cuts? Just walking so across this. We can't have tax cuts funded from borrowed money. To start so that's with. a no. That's a no. Okay. But on the, but on 15 seconds, okay. we've also sold our corporate tax rate. If our tax rates are too high, we won't attract the investment into this country. We won't attract the entrepreneurial talent and end up tax receipts will go backwards. Money still. 
I do support them. They're legislated. But I, what I want to see is a, ra a rise to the minimum wage. I do support that that be raised. And I do think we need to simplify our tax system when it comes to, for example, the payroll tax. We need to work at growing the pie. And that is how we can do it. We, we, the small businesses are the backbone of our country. Politicians talk about it all the time, but very little is ultimately done to assist them. Uh, the Greens oppose the stage three tax cuts. It'll rip $244 billion out of the budget. Sadly, Labor and Liberals support it. I don't think billionaires need a $9,000 a year per year forever tax cut. That's what Liberal and Labor are proposing. We would much rather that $244 billion goes to schools and hospitals instead of giving Clive Palmer a tax cut. <laughs> I, I would like to um, uh, look at this in the context of a plan, but I don't think we need tax cuts for the wealthy. I think that's hugely problematic. I, I disagree with uh, Craig Kelly about uh, corporate tax rates. The corporate tax rate is well above what companies actually pay. We need to make sure that those corporations are paying a fair share of tax. They're not at the moment. Uh, don't don't uh, look at the headline rate because that's nothing uh, as to what companies pay. Thank you. Gabriel Polychronis. Gabriel Polychronis from the Adelaide Advertiser. Thanks for being here. Um, my question is for Senator Rex Patrick. Um, you're up against your former boss, Nick Xenophon, uh, in the Senate race. On one hand, you've criticised his work for Chinese uh, tech giant Huawei, and you've even compared that work to working for a Nazi Germany arms manufacturer. Why is it that, on the other hand, you once asked him to be on your Senate ticket just a matter of months ago, and you also asked him, if you were to run for the lower house seat of Grey, would he endorse you? How do you explain that incredible contrast? I think Nick working for Huawei was a huge mistake. Uh, Huawei has been identified as, uh, by our security agencies as a risk to national security. Uh, and it's in that context, uh, noting the strategic environment we find ourselves in, that uh, uh, you know, I made the, the statement about uh, working for, for Siemens or working for Mesh Messerschmitt um, just prior to World War II. There is a concern there. Nick. Um, uh, you know, he, he's done extremely well in the past in, in, uh, uh, in the Senate. Um, I uh, did uh, offer to work with him, but uh, that, that would always be on the condition. He needs to be open and transparent about what he was paid, what his roles were, and any obligations he has outstanding in relation to Huawei, particularly noting that politicians uh, are the only people in Australia that are not required to register under the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme. So just to clarify, you, you would have had him on your Senate ticket had he been transparent? And met well, it, it, would, it would have been a, a, a requirement uh, for us to work together for him to be open and transparent, and that's actually all I've called for him to do. I think he made a mistake. He should put, a, put up his hand and say that was a mistake and then just spell out open and honestly uh, exactly uh, what uh, the arrangements were between himself and Huawei. The next question is from Krishani Danji. Shani Danji from SBS News. Uh, you've all outlined a lot of the priorities that you'd be pursuing uh, in Parliament. But can I ask, will you work together as a block? And if you do, what are the priorities that you would work together on to well, together? Well, speaking for me as a member of the lower house, I'm here to represent Warringah. That's the, the people that I represent. Um, I think there is alignment of principles in the crossbench, or some members of the crossbench, when it comes to looking at legislation on its merits, taking broad and varied uh, uh, briefings and, in, and um, submissions from, uh, in, from groups like the Law Council if on a question of integrity, those things are issue. I certainly cannot speak for other members of the crossbench. But if you look at the voting record of this last parliament, on a number of occasions, it was the crossbench that actually held a spotlight to the major parties for their failure to really take a stance, take a question of principle, when it was the failure to pass the amendments and the, and the uh, re recommendations of the Samuels Review to the EPBC Act, for example, or to stop fracking for gas of the Beetaloo Basin. For all the talk we get from the major parties, Labor and the Coalition voted together. And so that is selling out our future, selling out the ch our children's future, because that is a methane bomb waiting to happen. So no, I cannot speak for other mem independent members when it comes uh, to the lower house. But what 
I do know is some of the candidates running for election are amazing people, amazingly capable. They are qualified, they are experienced. We are talking award-winning journalists. We are talking CEOs of companies. We are talking to people that will bring their professional skills to the table and bring a real integrity and merit-based approach. And that's why I encourage everyone Australian in around Australia to support independent candidates. Adam Bant. I don't think you would find working together as a bloc because we're all representing different areas, different constituencies. Um, but one of the things I think if you look back at the last parliament that you'll find is that uh, there is an understanding that the crossbench, as diverse as we are, are bringing issues and putting them on the table when the other parties don't want to touch them. And so uh, this goes to the, the question before um, from Laura about reforms to parliament. One of the things uh, that I would certainly be pushing for is to ensure that in the next parliament there's greater opportunity for members of the crossbench, whatever part of the political spectrum they're sitting on, to bring matters before the parliament. We saw that back in the 2010 parliament and it got results. I got a, a bill through to give um, protection for firefighters who are contracting cancer made it easier for them to do that. That's the kind of thing when you have the systems in place that allow uh, third voices to get the issues on the agenda that the others don't want to touch and then progress them through the parliament, uh, you see some really good outcomes for people. I think uh, one of the things that this parliament has also shown is that there are many, many instances where Labor and go, sits up and goes and sits and votes with the Liberals and it's often the members of the crossbench, perhaps not all of them, but some of them who are voting independently on the basis of their own views, but calling them out and calling them to account. Um, and Craig Kelly. I fundamentally disagree with much of what Adam and Zali say especially when it comes to our mining industry, the idea that you can just trash our coal industry, that this year we'll earn $100 billion worth of exports. That is the reason why we can afford the hospitals that we have and plans like the NDIS. That's where we disagree. But I've got a confession to make. The last parliament, Adam and myself actually voted together on something. That's true, Adam, isn't it? I know you may not like to admit it in front of national television, but, but it's true. So we've shown that even though we may have these fundamental differences, that we can sit down and we can discuss things together and try and put policy that is for the best interests of our nation. Um, Sorry to make you go red there, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm just checking with... Can, can I just say got, something about that, Laura? Yes, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, if if okay. we could keep it short, we're run, sure. we squeeze Pe the time. People need to understand that passing legislation is about numbers. Uh, I say this with great experience in the crossbench in the Senate. The government will always try and find the easiest pathway through uh, uh, the Senate or through a house uh, where they don't have the, the, where they don't have numbers. So there is actually strength in crossbenchers sitting down and working together will be find common ground, and that is that that's absolutely possible. And there's also strength in working across the houses. So, for example, me bringing um, Helen Haynes's uh, uh, ICAC bill into the into the Senate. So uh, independents should work together. Okay. Um, this is the last question, and if you wouldn't mind all just limiting your uh, answers to one minute, just so we can get to the closes. Jess Davis, thank you. Jess Davis, ABC. My question's predominantly for Adam. Um, what's the WPI? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Sorry, Ron, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Um, last week there was a story on ABC Radio Melbourne about an old man who knew it was going to be his last election. So rather than voting for who he normally votes for, he went down to the local school and asked the students to tell him who he should vote for. And they told him to vote for the Greens. Uh, and he said it's the first and last time he'll ever vote for the Greens. Um, the proportion of young people voting for the Greens increases at every election. In 2019 it was 30% of millennials. What's your long-term strategy to retain those voters and why do they move away from your party as they get older? Well, certainly in Melbourne they haven't and part of the reason for that is that the message that people in Melbourne know and I'm hoping people across the country will hear at this election is that just as strongly as we fight for climate action, we're also going to fight for you. We don't take the donations from the big coal and gas corporations, which means we can fight for climate action, but we can also fight for things like getting dental and mental health into Medicare and pushing for free childcare, for example. Now, that's something that uh, is critical for families and especially for uh, women because the lack of free childcare in this country means that women's choices are impacted and especially at a time when they're potentially buying a house, uh, if you can afford it, but also making decisions about Korea. And so the message that we've, uh, and I guess the lesson that we've learnt from Melbourne and that we're taking to this election is that tackling not just 
the climate crisis, but what is a very real cost of living crisis, which is linked to the inequality crisis, and showing that we will fight just as hard for you on both, is something I think part of the reason that people are coming to us and our support is growing. Thank, thanks very much. Um, I think in the interest of making sure you all get your closing statements on the telly, we'll move to uh, closing statements. And there's been a very complicated uh, process of election for who, who goes first and last, uh, which thankfully I wasn't involved with. Uh, and the uh, first uh, speaker will be Craig Kelly for two minutes. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I need to quickly rebut some of the things that Adam and Zali said. This idea that there are all these subsidies for our fossil fuel industries is nonsense. This is the fuel excise, fuel road users excise that is not paid by farmers, miners and those that use fuel off the major roads. There's a nonsense. If Zali's right about these free markets and subsidies, let's get rid of all the subsidies for Chinese solar panels. Let's get rid of all the subsidies for wind turbines. We cannot continue to trash the industries of this nation that provide our wealth and give it our national competitive advantage. That is our coal, our gas and our iron ore. We've got to, as Australians, stand up and protect those industries. We see the idea that we go to net zero by 2050 when the communist Chinese say they will do nothing at all until 2030 and then maybe by 2060 they will do something. A policy of net zero which we reject will otherwise will surrender an economic, political and military advantage to the communist Chinese. And I, as a Member of Parliament, am not going to stand by and allow that to happen and be silent about it. We'll also stand up against these mandates. In a free democratic society, no Australian ever should be forced to undergo a medical intervention against their free will, being coerced to do so just to hold their job. There are thousands of Australians, tens of thousands at the moment, that are sitting on the sidelines of this economy, unable to work. We'll ensure they all get back to work and this never happens again. The people's medical privacy is protected. We set out a plan to repay the debt. We set out a plan to tackle housing affordability. One of the most important things that we must address is to return the great Australian dream to a young generation of Australians, and the plans that we have will do exactly that. This, is, this election, Australians have a very clear choice. And let's get real. The two-party system is broken. Australians do not feel rec re represented. The trust in government is falling with every year that goes past. A federal anti-corruption commission is absolutely essential for Australians to know their taxpayer dollar is going where it should, for bang for buck. We need to ensure we actually have processes in place to ensure accountability of government. The culture of the government has to change. We need people in Parliament that are going to look at things with merit. They're going to look at, take evidence, expert evidence, to ensure we actually put in place policies that are not just designed to ensure you get re-elected in three years' time, but actually ensure that in 10 years' time we are a prosperous and safe nation. That means you do have to tackle the big issues. We have to tackle climate change. We know we are on the forefront. We are heading for over three degrees of warming and the policies of the major parties do not keep us in accord with the Paris Agreement. Time and time again research and polls say to us it is the number one concern and yet at this election we haven't heard boo from either party about it. We know we can act and these are challenges but they are opportunities and when I look at my children which is why I got into politics it is to ensure a safer and healthier and better future for them. We can do politics differently. Don't let yourself believe the status quo and the media machine behind it that is hanging on to power for dear life. They do not want to see competition come into it. Make this the Kodak moment of politics. 2022, you can take back your vote. Make sure you as communities are represented. That's what I stand for for Warringah and that is what so many independents stand for. Let's be the change we want to see. We can do this better. Thank you. Band. Droughts, fires, floods, the climate crisis is here and it's getting worse. Coal and gas are the major causes of the climate crisis, but Liberal and Labor want more. Liberal and Labor are backing 114 new coal and gas projects around the country that will put your safety at risk. 
And meanwhile, young people can't afford to buy a house and even renting is out, uh, out of reach for many of them. We are at real risk of going down the road of becoming a US style unequal society. But it doesn't have to be this way. If just a few hundred people change their votes this election, we can kick this terrible government out and put the Greens in balance of power. And in balance of power, we will push the next government to take real climate action by keeping coal and gas in the ground and stop opening up new projects. And we'll push to tackle the cost of living crisis as well by getting dental and mental health into Medicare, building a million affordable homes and making childcare free. The Greens will fight First Nations justice with progress on truth and treaty, as well as voice in the next parliament. And we'll push to wipe student debt and also look after those who are doing it tough by lifting income support above the poverty line. Now, with one in three big corporations in this country paying absolutely no tax at all, the Greens will fund our plans by making the big corporations and billionaires pay their fair share of tax not by asking everyday people to pay more. So this election, vote Greens to turf out this terrible government, but to push the next government to do better. Vote climate, vote one Greens. So many areas, Laura, but let's just uh, look at a few, a, a few of them. Uh, openness and transparency of government. Everything the government does, they do so on your coin, and for public purpose. There's been too much secrecy that's, that's gone on uh, for too long. And that's uh, because, because we don't have a properly funded Auditor General, because the, the Houses of Parliament aren't working, because our FOI laws are, are, are not being adhered to, uh, because we don't have a federal ICAC that uh, keeps an eye on uh, eye out for corruptions and, mis, uh, and misfeasance and malfeasance. Uh, secondly, we need to grow our economic pie. I've already talked about that. We need to do more manufacturing and value add here in Australia uh, for uh, wealth and, and for resilience. We need to uh, make sure that uh, corporations and particularly multinationals are paying their fair share of tax. We need to make sure that we are getting a proper return on uh, our resources or, or the energy resources that we're exporting. We need to make sure we're not wasting money on uh, defence uh, projects. I'm a big, big, big believer in defence and deterrence, uh, but we waste a lot of money there. And certainly stop wasting money on pork barrelling. That is just a, a form of corruption that has to stop. We also need to, uh, to, tackle the, uh, uh, to, to tackle climate change and the environment. And you now one of my focuses is, is on the Murray-Darling. Uh, we've, we're simply not meeting the plan, and in some cases there are no consequences for not meeting the plan, and that has to be addressed. It is, a, it is our food bowl. We need to make sure we look after that properly. Um, we need to understand that we don't own Australia. Australia is not ours. It belongs to our children and our grandchildren and we must always think uh, about that when we think about policies. Thank you. Um, I might just ask one uh, final question and uh, ask for a very brief response of uh, 30 seconds or less from you. Um, there's been a lot of debate about the debates uh, as usual in this election campaign uh, and uh, the proposal for a, a debates commission didn't quite uh, take off. I'd just be uh, curious to get a very quick response from you about uh, the, the process of debates in this country and what you'd like to see done about it. We might go across this way again. Yeah, firstly, I think even in the federal parliament, the debates are a disgrace. There is no real debate in the federal parliament we have. <coughs> Members just get up and, and, and read speeches. We've got to change those arrangements in federal parliament so there can be real debate. The political debates during the election campaign have also been, I think, an insult to all Australians, the way they've been conducted. This presidential style of election campaign, our campaign should be about ideas about what is best for our nation. The campaign has failed from both Mr Albanese and Mr Morrison. Not often that I agree with Craig, but I do agree with that answer. But more importantly, we should have had a debate on the ABC. The ABC is our national broadcaster. It is there in times of trouble. It has kept people safe in floods and droughts. And yet here we have two people who would be, want to be Prime Minister of the next parliament refusing to address the questions of the Australian people in the, on the national broadcaster. I think that is shameful. I strongly support that we return the funding level and we need to get back to clear and accountable debate. 
I think it is, it is incredible actually that this presidential style setup, when we are not, this is not America, this is not a presidency, it is ultimately the parliament that will determine the government and it shouldn't be about just these two people. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Zali. We need an independent leaders debate commission. It shouldn't be up to the Prime Minister and the opposition leader of the day and haggling amongst commercial networks to decide what the Australian people get to hear during an election. We need an independent uh, leaders debate commission and we need debates on the ABC. Well, thank you for that. Um, Rick Patrick. Well, debates are supposed to be a, a, a competition of ideas, not a competition of insults. And sadly, that's what's been happening throughout this campaign. Uh, we also haven't had a lot of exposure for the independents who uh, do bring new ideas to the table. Um, uh, we need to have uh, open debate. Sadly, it's not happening. It's not happening in the parliament properly. And I think this is an election campaign people will look back uh, on and say that wasn't done very well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our speakers today.